the windy blue skies of Earth, slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory Star Lab. On Earth's moon, a quarter of a million miles beyond Star Lab, Omega General Industries have uncovered the corroded hull of an ancient spacecraft during a lunar mining operation. Excavating further, they discover the mummified bodies of 50 extraterrestrial humanoids and a strange statue made of jet black crystal. Mining Operations Director Ray Farrell contacts the science complex at Lunar Base 12. Uh, Roger, Omega General, mine pit 15, nine kilometers due north of Planius. A research team is on the way. Don't touch anything until they get there. Lunar Base 12, standing by. Two hours later, Professor Victor Conrad and his research team arrive at the excavation. They finish their preliminary investigation at 0830 the next morning. Hey, how's it going, Professor? Well, the spacecraft's been under the lunar surface for close to a thousand years, and the aliens were killed by something that turned their eyes and nervous systems into black crystal. Black crystal? Like the statue? The body samples and the statue samples are identical. Well, what do you make of that damn statue anyway? The thing gives me the creeps. I've seen that image a hundred times, Mr. Farrell, carved in stone on most of the Gothic cathedrals of Europe. It's a gargoyle a supposedly mythical creature that symbolizes ultimate spiritual evil. A thousand-year-old alien spacecraft buried beneath the lunar surface, and with it, a four-foot-tall gargoyle made of black crystal. Mysteries from a forgotten time, waiting for a solution, as part one of the ISA conspiracy, The Darkbringers, takes us from the bright side of the moon into the unearthly light and shadow of alien worlds. Letter base 12 to Star Lab Control. This is Star Lab. Go ahead. Professor Conrad is standing by for Dr. Cassidy. She's right here, Professor. Maura, has the statue arrived yet? It'll be here in about a half an hour. We heard from the shuttle a few minutes ago. How is it being transported to Earth? We've got an SET cruiser standing by. Well, tell them to be careful with it, Maura. When we ran the thermal tests, it started to emit an ultraviolet glow that had all of us hallucinating. Hallucinating? What do you mean? For a few minutes there, we thought the statue was coming to life. Scared the pants off of us. Coming to life? How did you get it to stop radiating? Well, Arthur had the presence of mind to shut down the thermal generators, but the statue was still about 10% active at room temperature. We finally sealed it in a small liquid oxygen pot. As long as it's kept cold, it's completely inert. We'll be careful with it, Victor. Anything else? Yes, we're going to continue experimenting with the statue samples we've kept here. I'm setting up a photon saturation test now, and I'd like to interface our data terminals with your Mycroft computer, so you can monitor the tests from there. Good, no problem, Victor. What will you need? A couple of standard mode multiplexer channels should do it. All right, I'll see to it right away. And Mora, would you mind setting up a visual link, just in case? Just in case of what? I am not sure, but this whole business with the statue has everyone on edge around here. Even though it is gone, something about it is still here. Something quiet and dark. Something invisible that waits in silent shadow, watching. Something the pilot and co-pilot of the lunar shuttle carrying the statue are unaware of. Lou, well, you'd better go ahead and start the pre-ignition cycle for the retros. It looks like they picked up about three minutes when I cleared the booster nozzles. Three minutes, 18 seconds to be exact. It just came up on the ETA monitor. I'll let Star Lab know we're going to be... Oh, hell. 
meteorite puncture right through number four cargo bay. Well, it's just as an our day, Lou. Oh, boy. How big's the hole? A little over three centimeters, according to the hull sensor. About the size of a marble. Marble, huh? Steely, cat's eye, or shooter? What? <laughs> Technical talk, Frank. I guess you didn't shoot marbles when you were a kid. <laughs> no, I lost mine by the time I was 13. <laughs> Give me my helmet. I'll go back and seal up that hole. Yeah. Yeah, well, the closest I ever got to marbles after that was Chinese checkers. Do you still play? Oh, once in a while. Well, let's have a game or two when we get to Starland. <laughs> oh, all right. Five bucks a game. Make it ten and you're on. Sold. Lunar Shuttle 19 to Star Lab. Star Lab, go ahead. We're making better time than I thought. Our revised ETA is 10 minutes, 10 seconds. Roger. Your new docking coordinates are 08 Alpha. Approach vector 292. Thanks, Star Lab. What's going back there, Lou? The meteorite sheared the top off the pond with a statue in it. The liquid oxygen's leaking out. Well, I told you it wasn't our day. Have you sealed a hole? In the hole, yeah. There's not much I can do about the pod. Well, they said to keep the statue on ice. Tell you what, flood the hole with chill vapor from the fire control system. That should keep it cold enough until we duck. Frank, there's something moving around back here. Well, uh, what is it? I don't know. It's hard to see anything through the chill vapor. Frank! shadow creature is loose aboard Lunar Shuttle 19. The sound of its unearthly fury merges with a terrified scream of co-pilot Lou Stratton. Then, silence. Pilot Frank Hollister activates the visual scanner in Cargo Bay 4. Oh my God. Lou! Firing the shuttle's booster rockets, he accelerates toward the safety of Star Lab, bringing with him the demon spirit of an alien world. It's all there in the flight recorder, Dr. Cassidy. How many times do I have to go through this? This is the last time, Lieutenant, I promise. It won't work. What do you mean? What won't work? All this interrogation, you're not going to trap me into saying anything I haven't said before. Look, no one's trying to trap you. Oh, come on. Who do you think you're kidding? Yesterday it was the security officer, Major Wheeler. Last night it was Dr. Rossiter. Today it's you. You're working up a psychological profile on me, right? You're wrong, Lieutenant. None of us had any oh, intention look, of... Lee Stratton was my best friend, Dr. Cassidy. But there just wasn't anything I could do. When did you realize it was too late? When I, when I switched on the visual scanner and saw him hanging upside down from the storage rafter. His face. The look on his face. What else did you see? The statue. Sitting there in the corner. Looking up at him. <laughs> Professor Conrad? Yes, I am right here. I've got Star Lab on Scrambler Channel M. It's Dr. Cassidy. Good, good. Patch her through. Victor, Lieutenant Stratton's autopsy report just came off the computer. I have the printout here in front of me. Anything definite on the cause of death? No, there were too many variables. But the projections range all the way from six kinds of heart failure to terminal neural induction. Terminal neuro... You don't mean death by psychic suggestion? Uh, that's what it says here. What about the black crystals in his eyes and nervous system? They're identical to those you took from the bodies of the extraterrestrials. But Mycroft couldn't compute either the source or the structure. What else? His brain. It was 364 grams lighter than the average for a man his age. What about the size? Well, that's what's so strange, Victor. The size wasn't changed at all, just the weight. What do you think? 
I think I'll go ahead with the experiments on the statue samples we've kept here. I don't know, Victor. The statue arrived at the ISA lab an hour ago. But couldn't you at least wait till they've had a chance to look it over? We can't afford to postpone the experiments any longer. Whatever happened on the shuttle might happen again. Besides, we've got a 48-hour head start on ISA. We may as well take advantage of it. All right. Victor, have you come up with anything to explain how the statue got out of the pod? Not unless you're willing to accept the possibility that the statue really isn't a statue at all, but some kind of transmorphic creature that feeds off the psychic energy of intelligent beings. Well, I'm going to have to think about that. Good luck with the test. And please, Victor, be careful. We will. You got a minute, Victor? Of course, Rachel. Come on in. We just finished the comparative analysis of the scanner tapes we made of the statue when it was here, and the scanner data of the statue transmitted from Star Lab. I don't know if you're ready for this. We weren't. But the statue has changed. Changed? In what way? Well, the scan made after the shuttle incident shows that it's 60 millimeters taller than it was when it left here. Are you sure? We cross-checked everything. What else? Well, the face. It's not looking straight ahead anymore. It's looking up at an angle of 57 degrees. Go on. The statue's heavier by 364 grams. As the mystery of the black crystal gargoyle deepens, so does the urgency to discover and resolve its supernatural secrets. At Lunar Base 12 Science Complex, Professor Conrad and his research team prepare a photon saturation test on two small crystal samples removed from the statue during an earlier experiment. Rachel, will you please ask Arthur and Misha to meet me in conference room 4? I'd like to have a word with them before we start. And you had better join us, too. Oh, right away, Victor. Back aboard Star Lab. Preparation of a visual link between Star Lab control and the interior of Professor Conrad's moon laboratory is supervised by Maura Cassidy. Sally, I think the visual feed from Lunar Base should be cross-linked with Mycroft. That way, if something goes wrong with the VTR, we can always retrieve the pictures from the computer. Okay. I'll have it programmed in about 15 minutes. On Earth, the statue arrives at the ISA Research Center and is locked in a refrigerated laboratory vault where ISA technicians begin their own experiments. All right, let's shave off a couple of two micron specimens and get them under the electron microscope. Hideous damn creature, isn't it? Wonder what it's looking up at. Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff bank the SET interceptor Solaris away from the freighter convoy they've been escorting to the Timian 3 shipping lanes and jet towards Star Lab. Did they ever figure out what it was? Not really. Scientific opinion was divided about 70-30. In favor of an alien spacecraft? No. In favor of a meteor. How many people saw the explosion? Well, there were quite a few villages about 500 miles away, and everyone living in them saw it. At that distance? Skipper, when that thing exploded, it lit up the sky as far away as London. And the sky stayed that way for three days and nights. Huh. When did all this happen? 1908. Amazing. Where do you get these books, anyway? Bingrid, the librarian on Starlight. No. Oh. She came across this one while she was looking for an Oscar Wilde novel that Mora wanted to read. And what made her think that you'd be interested? The title. It's called The Fire Came By. Star Lab Control to Solaris. Uh, this is Solaris. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, Mara would like to speak with you. Put her on. John, do you have enough fuel to take a side trip to the moon? Buddy? Yeah, we're okay. What do you want us to do, Mara? I've scheduled a conference with Professor Conrad. Pick him up at Lunar Base 12 and bring him here. He's starting an experiment now, but... Uh, he should be finished by the time you get there. Okay, we'll take care of it, Mara. Hello, buddy. Goodbye, buddy. Cute, Mara. Cute. In the science complex at Lunar Base 12, Professor Conrad places a sample of the statue into a Stellatron Systems PC-80 photon chamber. On 
On Star Lab, Mora watches by remote visual link as Professor Conrad seals the chamber, sits down at a control console and presses a button. Radiant white light illuminates the chamber's observation ports as the needle-thin beams of six neothane zellium lasers penetrate the statue's specimen. On Star Lab, Mora monitors the experiment by remote visual link. On one screen, a wide-angle interior view of Professor Conrad's moon laboratory. On a second screen, the bright metal pyramid-shaped photon chamber. Rachel, the spectroscope is starting to shift out of phase. Will you please check it? Right away, thank you. Arthur, what was your last refractive index reading? It didn't even register. The crystals are absorbing all coherent light up to 8,000 angstroms. All right. Let's switch over to the neon borazine lasers. Program them for a one milliradian beam, and we'll work our way up from there. All right. How are you doing, Bora? I'm not quite sure. I don't think I should have had whatever that was I had for lunch. You get some pretty weird food around here sometimes. Well, chew a couple of papaya enzyme tablets. They'll fix you up in no time. And if you wish to stretch your legs or anything, you'd better do it now. This next part of the experiment is going to take a while. No, I think I'll just sit here and plan my revenge on the Star Lab ship. <laughs> We're ready, Victor. It looks like intermission's over, Mora. All right, Rachel. Turn them loose. Jerry, contact the Solaris and tell them to get to Lunar Base 12 as fast as they can. Starlight control to Solaris. Starlight control to Solaris. Sally, get hold of this the ISA lab emergency. and tell them to stop their experiments with the statue until they hear from me. Uh, this is Solaris. Go ahead, Jerry. I'm on my way. I've got the Solaris, Mora. We're coming up on it now, Mora. Have you had any radio contact with them? No, not a word. Even the microwave safety beacon has stopped transmitting. Skipper. Screen five. My God, what happened? John, buddy, what is it? What do you see? Mara, Lunar Base 12 no longer exists. What do you mean? It's been blown to pieces, completely leveled. The entire base. Skipper, screen six. Buddy, what is it? What's happening? A ship, just above the horizon. It's moving away from us. Magnify it, buddy. Looks something like an old Tarantula-class gunship. Except it's about five times bigger. Jerry, record this. We're rolling. It's black. Stacked wings angled down about 60 degrees. Yellow markings that look like Cyrillic script, only upside down. Gee, Skipper, what do you make of that? Keep talking, buddy. Short black spikes are starting to bristle out all over the hull. Uh oh, Skipper, it's turning around. Mara, stand by. We're going in for a closer look at that ship. Open a close proximity channel, buddy. Let's see if they'll talk to us. You're on, Skipper. This is Earth ship Solaris. Please identify yourself. Skipper, let's get some altitude before their aim improves. This is Earth ship Solaris. Our intentions are not hostile. Please. Try it one more time, but that is it. You better let me do it, Skipper. Every time you talk to them, they shoot at us. Solaris, there is still time. Time? For what? Escape. From what? Ask your dead brothers and sisters on the wasteland below us. Damn you. You did that? You murdered all those people? But why? They were committing sacrilege. Just who the... Who are you? Disciples. Of what? Lightlessness. I've had about all of this I can take. Hold on, buddy. Skipper, lightning is pouring out of those spikes and crawling all over the hull of their ship. Activate the rest of the laser turrets, buddy. We're going around again. Them, Skipper. That lightning soaked up our lasers like a sponge. We're hit. Flame out on number four thruster. There goes number two. The starboard fuel.
fuel pods are split open. Skipper, if we don't get out of here now, we'll have to set her down on the moon. I don't want to leave that ship to Starlab. Solaris, we are aware of the thing you name. Don't concern yourself with its safety. It is one of our destinations. Come on, Skipper. It's now or never. Use docking bay 4, John. The crash barriers are up and the fire control crew is standing by. John, where's that ship? Right behind us. Turn your seat around, buddy. Here we go. John! Buddy, are you alright? We're okay. Come on, buddy. Let's get out of here. Mara, the alien ship. Screen 10. Listen to me, Starlab. Who are you? I am Stygos, High Priest of the Trell. You have stolen the symbol of our redemption. The symbol? The statue? Narl is his rightful name. We have traced him to your moon. We know his presence has graced the machine you live in. Where is he? I don't know. Then take your last look at the stars. Please wait. I know where he is. But if you destroy us, you'll never find him. Because I'm the only one who does know. The secret of Narl's whereabouts is not yours to keep. And the lives of the 200 men and women at Lunar Base 12 were not yours to take. They were violating the sanctity of Narl by subjecting the fragments of his being to the light. But they didn't know they were doing anything wrong. Narl is not a merciful divinity in the sense that you understand mercy. Neither is he forgiving in the sense that you understand forgiveness. But there's nothing about innocence to forgive. Where is he? I don't know. <laughs> Suffer the darkness until you do. Mora! <laughs> Mora! What's happening to her? Don't touch her! Don't touch her! Buddy, the medical alert! Which one? Which button? Sector 4, buddy! The yellow one! Mora! Mora, don't try to Just lie still! This is medical 4. Stay where you are. An emergency unit is on the way. Jerry! Your hands! Are you alright? I, I guess so. What happened? Well, she was watching the screen, talking to the alien, and then the screen threw off a tremendous burst of color, and then the lightning was all over her. It was so cold, it burned my hands. John? John? I'm right here, Mora. And so is Buddy. Dr. Rossiter's on her way. John? I'm blind! <laughs> when the lashing ribbons of lightning finally release her, Mora falls. Blind. Your blindness is just a warning, Mora. How long it lasts depends upon how soon you tell me where Narl is. Shut down all the transmitter frequencies, Jerry. Now run a check on Screen 10's receiver circuits. Whatever they use must have come in through the outside lens. Okay. What are you going to do, Mora? If they find out where the statue is, God knows how many more people they'll kill. I can't tell them. I just can't. Are you sure? Yes. No, I don't know. Why does everything depend on me? Can't anyone else make a decision? John, the receiver circuits on screen 10 are completely burned out. Okay, shut the louvers and all the outside scanner lenses. They're closed. Oh, Dr. Rossiter, I'm ever glad to see you. Oh, Diana. Mara, what happened? I've been blinded. Oh, my dear God. There's a hostile alien ship outside. It fired some kind of energy beam in through one of the scanner screen lenses. All right, Mora. Now, let's have a look. I'm shining the light directly into your eyes. Can you see it? No. But I think I can feel it. I'm taking the light away. Now, I'm shining it into your eyes again. Yes. Yes, I can feel it. Let's get her on the stretcher and take her up to sickbay. Take her for a second. Okay. 
Jerry, you better have Dr. Rossiter take a look at your hands. Nah, I'm okay now. What do we do now, Mora? Tell Stygos you know where the statue is. But explain that it's going to take time to get it back here. If that doesn't work, use our photon injectors on his ship. Maybe they'll be able to do what the laser cannons on the Solaris couldn't. I'll contact Commissioner White and tell him what's going on. Well, come on, Diana. Communications first, and then sickbay. Sound general quarters, Jerry. Okay, open a close proximity frequency. Let's see how good we are at telling the big lie. Stygos, this is Captain Graydon. Have you made a decision? Yes, we've decided to give you the statue. Our sensors indicate that Norl is no longer aboard your machine. No, he isn't, uh, but we've contacted the laboratory where he was taken and our scientists are sending him back. You're lying, Captain Graydon. We've monitored no transmissions. Close the channel, Jerry. Now open number eight scanner lens and project a target grid onto the screen. All right, interface the coordinates of their ship with our photon injectors. We have a target interlock. Stand by. And for God's sakes, keep away from the screen. Three, two, one. No good, Skipper, no good. Their force field is deflecting everything. The ship's coming around. Jerry, shut down screen. Eight. Too late. There. The lightning. It stopped. What happened? Jerry, let's see what's going on. Skipper, the ship's moving away from us. Buddy! Look! What is it? Magnify it, Jerry. My God. It's a city. A floating city. As the black metal insect ship of the trail stalks away into the dark distances of deep space, a huge floating platform appears and slowly moves toward Star Lab. On the platform, a dazzling architectural phantasm, a dream city of white crystal towers, transparent steel minarets, gleaming arches, and pale metal domes. As John, Buddy, and Jerry stand silently in Starlab control, watching the approach of the shining mirage-like metropolis, Mora tries desperately to contact Commissioner White at the ISA Command Center on Earth. I'm sorry, Dr. Cassidy, but it's a top security conference. Commissioner White left strict orders that he wasn't to be disturbed. Listen, you, we've got an emergency situation up here. I'm only following orders. Yeah, right. That's what they all say. Now, Mora, if you don't change your tune, I'm going to be forced to stick a tranquilizer syringe in your backside. ISA, please have him contact me as soon as possible. I will, Dr. Cassidy. ISA, out. If I could only see. <laughs> Mora, we haven't even examined you yet. And already you're acting like a poor little orphan child who's got herself lost in the woods. I am. <laughs> yes, you am. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself now. We have too much to do. Attention all Starlab personnel. The emergency alert is terminated. Stand down from general quarters and return to your stations. Dr. Cassidy, please contact Captain Graydon and Starlab Control. John, it's Mara. What's happening? The troll ship has broken off its attack and left the area. What did you do to get him to back off? It wasn't anything we did. It was something else. What? A city. A what? A floating city. Are you serious? Mora, he's serious. It's holding a position two kilometers off Star Lab. A huge space platform with a fantastic white city built on it. It looks like something out of a futuristic Arabian Nights. I'll be right there. Come on, Diana, take me back up to the bridge. John, is it still out there? Has moved an inch. Oh, Mara. It's so beautiful. Are you here, Jerry? I'm right here. Please, open a close proximity frequency. Go ahead, Mara. This is Dr. Mara Cassidy. Would you please identify yourself? 
Dr. Maura Cassidy. Which of those three names do you have the greatest affection for? Maura. We are the Deodons, Maura. And we inhabit the star city of Imbria. I am Phaedra, Sky Priestess of the Before Time. We know your machine has experienced an encounter with the Trell. Did Stygos harm you? Yes. Yes, he did. I'm blind. Can you feel the light upon your eyes? Why, yes. Yes, I can. Then it will be my pleasure to restore your sight. It will? Of course. We have no vehicles of our own. So transport yourself here to Imbria. A projection of light will guide you. I'll be waiting. <gasps> oh, yes. Jerry? Jerry, call the short-range vehicle hangar and tell them to get a shuttle ready. John? Bonnie? Diana? Let's go to Imbria. Imbria. A fantasy of gleaming crystal and bright transparent metal. A construct of light and serenity and magic. A floating star city, casting its radiance over all who grope their way along the blind corridors of alien worlds. Inside the white crystal city of Embria, which floats two kilometers beyond Starlab, Phaedra kneels in her meditation chamber, listening to a sky mantra, the Diatan healing music she will use to restore Mora's sight. On Starlab, Mora, John, Buddy, and Dr. Diana Rossiter enter the short-range vehicle hangar and move toward the shuttle that will take them to Imbria. How's it going, Bobby? You might as well get aboard, John. We'll have her fueled in another ten minutes. Aboard the Black Trail insect ship, Stygos, alone in his quarters, receives a message from his tracking systems officer. Stygos, what do you want? As our ship withdrew from Starlab, we monitored a transmission. It was the voice of the female who received the transmission. A laboratory on Earth. Alter course. That laboratory is our new destination. Meanwhile, at the ISA laboratory, Commissioner White and Julian Benedict, head of the World Council's Experimental Weapons Section, are debating over which of their two organizations should have possession of the Black Crystal statue, Narl. Matthew, if we can take the energy that statue puts out and incorporate it into some of our experimental thought weapon hardware, we'll be years ahead of everyone else in that area. Don't you see the advantage of that? No, Julian, I don't. This is a science complex and not an arsenal. Matthew, weapons development is as much a part of science as molecular biology or celestial mechanics. Is it? When was the last time you heard of someone being killed by a microscope or a mathematical equation? The bomb started out as a mathematical equation, didn't it? Yes, and so did triple-yield agriculture and antibiotics and space flight. The bomb was created within the reality of a global war, Julian. That reality no longer exists, and I see no reason to encourage its return. The last thing we need is a repetition of the arms race of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Didn't the petroleum war teach you anything? That had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with this, Julian, and you know it. I want that statue. Julian, do you believe in the evolution of human consciousness? Of course I do. And what about immortality? Do you believe in that? Yes, I suppose so. Then would you mind telling me of what use weapons are to evolution and of what use war is to immortality? I didn't come here to discuss abstract philosophy. The statue stays here, Julian. 
Do you know what this is, Matthew? I haven't the slightest idea. It's a World Council directive signed by the Secretary, ordering you to release the statue to my section. Julian, we both know your section is being phased out. Why are you going through all this? It won't be phased out for another year. But if I can help it, it won't be phased out at all. After all, what if the statue should fall into the wrong hands? What would be our defense against it? Can I see that directive? Thanks. You'll have to excuse me now, Julian. I have things to do. And stay away from my people. I've already given them orders not to cooperate with you. As far as you're concerned, I'm the ISA and this is between us. What is this, Matthew? Some kind of conspiracy? Yes, it is, Julian. A conspiracy of my values against yours. Everyone strapped in? Wait, wait a minute, buddy. Maura, shouldn't that strap go over instead of under? What strap? The one you're sitting on. Oh, I was wondering what that was. <laughs> Better? Yes, thanks, Diane. Okay, buddy, let's run it down. Navigation and thrust vector systems? Check. Attitude gyros? Locked. Service propulsion and reaction control systems? Positive. Mara, Commissioner White on B channel. Thanks, Jerry. Punch him in, buddy. Mara, I just got your message. What's going on up there? More than I ever thought possible. How soon can you get here? It all depends. Does it have anything to do with the statue? It has everything to do with the statue. All right, I'll leave right away. Now, where were we? Uh, ignition, Skipper? <laughs> Don't mind if I do. As John, Buddy, Mora, and Dr. Rossiter jet toward the Diaton Star City, Imbria, Commissioner White enters the short-range vehicle dome near the ISA laboratory and boards a priority shuttle. Five minutes later, the shuttle is towed from the dome to launch pad six. Then, as the setting sun slowly erases the day, the shuttle lifts off and disappears into the darkening sky, racing toward Starlab on twin streams of fire. Meanwhile, 550 kilometers above and 400 kilometers south of the ISA laboratory, the Black Trail insect ship enters the Earth's ionosphere. We are approaching the laboratory, Stagos. Have precautions been taken? Our impulse deflectors will confuse the echo patterns of any detection beam that touches us. We will appear to them only as a flaw mirage. Leave me now. I sense that you are restless now, but be patient. Your disciples are near. Your deliverance is at hand. Where are we now, buddy? How close? We're 1,700 meters away, Mora. There's the beam. Bright and beautiful. Who is with you, Mora? Three friends. John, Buddy, and Diana. Who is your pilot? I am Phaedra. Uh, John. Just a moment. John, our scan tracings indicate that your propellant emits a lethal mist. Will you please terminate your engines? Our atmosphere is delicate. If I shut down the thrusters, we won't be able to maneuver. The light will control your vehicle and guide it safely down. All right. Shut them down, buddy. World Council Communications, your ISA. This is the ISA. Go ahead. Is Mr. Julian Benedict still there? Secretary Stone is returning his call. Uh, yes, he is. He's in the laboratory complex. Uh, stand by, please. Mr. Benedict, I have Secretary Stone on the line. I'd like to speak to him privately, if that's possible. 
Conference room six is empty. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, Commissioner White ignored your directive, tore it up as a matter of fact. Well, if I had his sense of ethics, I probably would have done the same. What do you mean? I've had some serious second thoughts about this whole thing, Julian. I think we'll let the matter of the statue rest until the President and Vice President get back from Draconia. But, Mr. Secretary... Was there anything else, Julian? <sighs> no, sir. Thank you. You can let it rest if you want to, but I can't. Julian Benedict, a man slowly becoming obsolete in a universe that will soon have no use for his services. A weapons maker on the verge of taking his first desperate step into an alien world. Julian Benedict sits alone in conference room six at the ISA Earth Laboratory, silent, sad, filled with resentment. The experimental weapons section he heads up is being phased out by the World Council. An attempt to gain control of the Trell statue and use its energy in a final desperate attempt to prove his usefulness has failed. system has little use for you, Julian Benedict. Wait, who's there? I am Stygos, High Priest of the Trell. What are you doing on this channel? It's a top priority frequency. We have access to whatever frequencies we choose. Wh where are you? Hiding in the darkness above. How did your ship get past our defense scanners? That's of no importance now. What is, then? What do you want? What you want. The icon of Narl. Is it yours? Ten thousand millennia past, our planet was visited by a nameless race of darkling beings with magnificent wings and eyes of fire. We were without intellect then. Nothing more than restless shadows hiding in the sea crawling out at night to feed off the night mists. The darkling priests gave us the gift of Narl, and through him flowed the powers of redemption that transformed us. Then, a nomadic stealer ship came down from the air and took Narl away, thinking he was a construct of a precious gem called Nightstone. We know now that the stealer ship malfunctioned, causing it to impact on your moon. The violators built a dome as protection from the lunar cold, but they made the mistake of taking Narl into the shelter with them. How did you know he'd been found? Our Parsec scanners have been probing the universe for centuries. Do you have access to Narl? Why don't you just take him? That was our intention, but now we know the chamber that imprisons him is small. If we destroy it, Narl may be harmed. Suppose I do have access to Narl. So what? Free him, and I'll give you the secret of his power. It'll take time. I understand. ISA Communications. Please put me through to the Security Bureau in my section. Right away, Mr. Benedict. Security? This is Julian Benedict. Find Major Ripley and tell him to meet me in my office in 15 minutes. Starlab Control, this is ISA Priority Shuttle 1 requesting docking coordinates. Roger, Shuttle 1. What's your ETA? 10 minutes, 30 seconds. 10 plus 30. Roger. Your coordinates are Niner 60 at subvector 448, docking bay 9. Roger. Well, Jerry, this is Commissioner White. Is Mara there? Mara? No. Didn't she talk to you? Well, it was a short conversation. An alien ship attacked us about an hour ago. 
Mara was blinded. Blinded? Well, how is she? I don't know. She's not here. Where is she? On Imbria, the Diaton city that's floating just about two kilometers off Starlab. Welcome to Imbria, Mora. Phaedra, you don't know how glad I am to be here. I'm Diana, Phaedra. This is John. Phaedra? And this is Buddy. Wow. Are you ready, Mora? I... yes, I am. You can't imagine what it's like being blind. Yes, I can, Mora. I'm blind. What? Oh, I'm sorry. All diatons are blind. It's our legacy. But how can you see us? How did you manage to build this city? I sense you. As clearly as if I had sight, Diana. And as for Imbria, it was dreamed into existence. Dreamed? No. When? During the final century of the before time, an age of radiance unified the minds of all Diatans and transformed us into Shiva, the dreamer who never awakes. When did the Sage of Radiance end? It ended with the coming of the Trell. They burned our fields and forests with terrible fire weapons. They suffocated our cities and canals with poison mist. Two thousand legions of Trell warriors. And before they went away, they blinded all of us. Oh, Phaedra. Why did they do that? The icon of their god had been stolen. They were angry. That damn statue again. Did they think you'd taken it? No. We were made to suffer their rage because we represented everything Narl had taught them to hate. Why didn't they destroy this city? It was orbiting behind one of our moons. Those of us who survived the Trell invasion came here when we realized we'd never be able to rebuild our planet. Not even by dreaming? A dream can't always change what is, Mora. But it can create what isn't. Are you taking control to Star Lab? Star Lab, go ahead. Uh, has Commissioner White arrived here? It's urgent. I'm right here. What's the problem? A security police unit from the experimental weapons section is in the laboratory. They say they have orders to take the statue. Damn it, Julian. Who's the officer in charge? Major Ripley. Call the lab. Tell Ripley if he doesn't want to spend the next ten years in Jastro prison, he'd better talk to me. Where are we, Phaedra? The Synergy Chamber. Who else is here? Hold out your hands. Oh, who are you? This is Aleph, the Avatar of Imbria. Welcome to our dream, Mora. Hello. There's a recliner in front of you, Mora. Turn and lie down on it. I'm going to place three small Synergy prisms on your forehead now. Oh. It's so warm. In a moment, you'll hear the sound of a sky mantra. The music we use to heal those outside the dream. When the music begins, think only of your eyes and how they looked out upon the various dimensions of your life. Everything. everything, it was so beautiful. It was 
just so beautiful. I thought I died. Deep within the star city of Imbria, Mora lies sleeping, exhausted by the Diatan sky mantra ritual, which has not only restored her sight, but for one fantastic moment has opened her mind to eternity. Meanwhile, Alif has led John and Buddy back to the Star Lab shuttle, which sits on an illuminated white crystal platform in the center of Imbria. Inside the shuttle, John contacts Commissioner White on Star Lab and learns what is taking place at the ISA laboratory on Earth. How did you find out about Stigos and Benedict, Commissioner? An ISA communications technician was filing the lab's hourly intercom recordings and came across their conversation. Well, where's Benedict now? An ISA security unit arrested him 15 minutes ago. Ripley, too. Well, what's the present situation? Well, Stigos will probably move against the laboratory when he doesn't hear from Benedict again. John, uh, stand by, Commissioner. Yes, what is it, Aleph? The vault where Narl is. Do you know its precise latitude and longitude? Commissioner White does. Why? We're going to take possession of Narl before Stigos does. Mora. Hi, Mora. How are you feeling? I feel wonderful. What's going on? Why are you two wearing your pressure suits? Well, we just talked to Commissioner White. Stigos is about that far away from attacking the ISA lab. We're going down for the statue. You'll never make it in time. Earth's an hour away by shuttle. We're not going by shuttle. We're going by light. Teleportation. John, buddy, secure your helmets. Uh, this isn't gonna hurt, is it? I think you'll find it a rather pleasant experience, buddy. Lower the cylinders. The dematerialization thresholds have integrated, Aleph. Purge the cylinders. It really happened, Skipper. We're here. God, this thing is heavy. Come on, let's get a harness around it so we can pick it up. Okay. Let's, let's pick it up. Here we go. Raise the cylinders, Phaedra. Where is it? What happened? Where's the statue? Oh, no. We lost it. Phaedra. Nal was too powerful. He rejected the translocation process just beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Location being tried to take him, but he escaped. No. Take him aboard and bring him to me. Then set a course for Imbria. The trail ship is at 90 power spans in closing, Aleph. The scan tracers acknowledge that Narl is aboard. What can we do, Aleph? Begin the light storm cycle, Phaedra. What's going on? Imbria is now being enclosed by an aurora sphere of ionized winds, invisible to the trail sensors. As their ship penetrates this enclosure, their force field will be temporarily neutralized. At that moment, Phaedra will flood the aurora sphere with liquid light. The ensuing photon storm will destroy them. The trail ship is now 10 power spans in closing. Five power spans and closing. Barrier penetration. Narl is free! Yes! Narl is free! Phaedra, the liquid light injectors.
a blinding glance of light, a final scream, and the huge trell insect ship convulses and disintegrates, its luminous fragments growing cold and dark as they pass like demon whispers into the deafening silence of the void. Phaedra, are you going to guide us away from the city with another light projection? Yeah, I'm really into riding light beams. You may use your engines, John. We'll neutralize the exhaust vapors when we decontaminate the residue of the trail ship. Thank you, Phaedra. Thank you for everything you've done, Phaedra. Goodbye. Oh, well, goodbye, goodbye, Phaedra. 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 Goodbye, You didn't tell them, did you? I saw no reason. If they knew that we alone survived the Trell invasion, and that our blindness makes the generation of life impossible, it would only make them sad. But we'll heal ourselves in time. And then perhaps, when we see them again, there will be more to the dream than just you and me. As the Starlab shuttle rockets away from Imbria, the radiant dream city slowly drifts away into a universe of stars and suns and secrets. Inside the city, a man and a woman in search of the miraculous, moving through the invisible dimensions of time and space toward other, more distant celebrations. Lightstorm, the ISA Conspiracy, was written by Ron Thompson. Our cast included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guests Ernie Anderson, Robert W. Morgan, Olin Soule, Michael Rye, Rusi Taylor, Francis Bay, and Peter Leeds. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until again we meet, this is Roger Dressler, inviting you to join us soon for further adventures into alien worlds.